Bonjour. The topic this time is gaps and lacunae in the civil code or in legislation in a civil law jurisdiction. Another way to phrase this would be to say the law is silent. Uh, you are facing a situation that seems to be unprovided for. Whereas the law, you do not find the answer in the code or in uh, the legislation that is dealing with the topic. This should not, however, happen too often when you are dealing with a civil code. We have seen that the very concept of codification is creating a comprehensive set of rules that should be able to cover all kinds of situations in a rather systematic manner. And we have seen that codes are not fact specific. We have read in the preliminary discourse of Portalis that uh, the legislators should not be expected to anticipate and provide for every solution, which means that law should be general enough to cover situations of all kind, whether they have been contemplated or not at the time when the legislation was made. However, at times, you may get the impression that the law is silent and that may even apply to a code as we will see with examples. Look, if you look at traditional civil codes, they do not seem to have rules on same-sex marriage. May you say that it is a silence of the code or a gap? That's the question. Well, the view probably was that at the time when these codes were meant, marriage meant the union of man and woman, which excluded same-sex couple. And certainly for those who made the code, there was no, certainly no intended gap here. The answer was quite clear. We marry men and women together, not people of same gender. However, we know that things evolve and over time, there may be cracks or gaps appearing inside the code. So actually, what are we going to see in this presentation is gap filling, you know, answering these silences of the code or making the code speak in a particular situation, intersects, not intercepts, as the slide goes saying, I have here an interesting lapsus, it intersects with interpretation. Look, the French Civil Code nowhere said that spouses had to be of different gender to marry. You could look and read very carefully the Code of 1804. There is absolutely no provision about gender diversity or similarity. Uh, the code, however, included a number of prohibitions. For example, incest marriage would be a no. Uh, bigamy is also made illegal. But there is no requirement of gender difference. Should we conclude that there is a gap? The conventional answer was that, well, this is a matter of interpretation, and we have to look into the meaning of marriage. Let's look at the definition of marriage. And when the code was made, you can be sure that all the existing dictionaries define marriage as the union in man of man and woman. So that was the answer. But as I said earlier, definitions can evolve. So I have here a metaphor that may help understand uh, the idea of uh, gaps or lacuna and maybe give you a clue as to how do I fill those gaps. You're probably familiar with the holes that you find when you are cutting a slice of Swiss cheese. Uh, it's the same with French bread. The French baguette has sometimes holes. The door, when retracting, is leaving holes, leaving you to think that, uh, well, there is missing cheese or missing crumb in your bread. 
well, the gap in the cheese should be filled with cheesy materials, then you will think, and the gap in the bread with crumb. Unless, of course, but that's a matter of taste, you prefer to combine bread and cheese. I hope you're not watching that at uh, lunch or dinner time, because I'm, certainly you will develop an appetite, but I want you to develop an appetite for learning. Oh, sorry. Okay, let us see how some civil codes address uh, the question of gaps and gap filling. And you had several examples, by the way, in the reading material for this module on the sources of the law. Uh, in Louisiana, the answer is in Article 4 of the code, saying absence of legislation or custom, because as we have seen, Louisiana indeed accepts that the sources of the law are legislation or custom. And you see here that in such a case, um, the court is bound to proceed according to equity and to decide equitably, resort is made to justice, reason, and prevailing usages. The language has changed with the last revision of the preliminary title in 1987. The code used to say, and I cite here to the original text, to decide equitably, an appeal is to be made to natural law and reason or received usages where positive law is silent. Interestingly, we still have equity, but natural law has disappeared. And regarding the abandonment of the reference to natural law in the Louisiana Civil Code, you may want to look at the revision comments below the article, and A tells you this provision reproduces the substance of Article 21 of the Louisiana Civil Code of 1870. It doesn't change the law. So they remove the word, but without any intent of changing the law. And then you have this extraordinary explanation in B, the term natural law in Article 21 has no defined meaning in Louisiana jurisprudence and is not reproduced in this revision. I would say, of course, where did you ever see that natural law has a particular meaning in French, Louisiana, uh, or uh, Argentinian jurisprudence? That is a rather strange explanation. It rather feels that the draftsman was kind of embarrassed in having that word natural law, which is very, very difficult to explain and uh, to uh, define. Uh, do we have a problem with natural law? If you look at the original projet of the French Civil Code, the projet du gouvernement that uh, led to the Civil Code, uh, Portalis actually had written, quote, in civil matters, when there is no express law, the judge must act as a minister of equity. Equity is the return to natural law and to receive usages where positive law is silent. You clearly have the opposition of positive law and natural law. French legislators rejected that provision. They say, no, we don't want any reference to natural law in the code because we want the code to be positive law. And we want actually maybe to push natural law, you know, outside of French law on the French, uh, but, but not there, please. There was indeed the concern at the time that the reference to natural law may be used by Catholics or religious people to say, well, you know, natural law includes the will of God, etc. And they wanted to do a secular work. And by the way, this transpired also in Louisiana when the uh, preliminary title was uh, revised and uh, they decided also to evict natural law. Uh, I even heard, uh, it's been reported to me that Professor Yanopoulos was with Professor Litvinov sitting in the, the committee preparing the revision Litvin, uh, Yanopoulos was going, saying, I killed natural law. Natural law is no longer part of Louisiana law. I killed it, did he say with his heavy Greek accent. 
Uh, Fred, what did the French do? They eliminated the reference to equity and natural law, and look what you have in the French code. Instead, a judge who refuses to give judgment on the pretext of legislation being silent, obscure, or insufficient may be prosecuted for being guilty of a denial of justice. Whoa, this is really strong language. The initial recommendation, you know, do equity if the law is silent, is replaced with a threat. Denial of justice was actually a crime that could be punishable with the judge being suspended or being deprived of a salary during a period of six months. That was a big deal. But it's strange nonetheless, because would you, who would think of a judge who would refuse to give a judgment because the law is not clear or the law is silent? The judge would go either way, either you fine for the plaintiff or you dismiss the claim, but you don't send parties home and say, oh, I'm sorry, there is no law to be applied to the problem. I cannot even decide who's right or who's wrong. And the judge would say, well, they will tell the plaintiff there is no law supporting your claim and therefore I dismiss your claim. So that language is very strange. And it comes actually from medieval times when uh, lords, when they had the right of justice, were under the obligation to decide cases brought before them. They could not refuse to act as judges because it was part of their duty as a lord uh, in, uh, within their jurisdiction. So back to the drawing board, you know, some systems are proposing the solutions, others are not. Okay, you've got codes giving assistance to the judge and telling them what to do. Louisiana is one of them, and you have seen other examples uh, in the course supplement. And you have those codes like France or Belgium who give no guidance and leave the task maybe to doctrine and jurisprudence to tell the judge what to do when the law is silent. So actually, it's very it's fascinating to look at the recommended methodologies because it gives you a hint uh, regarding the national legal culture, and it also gives you indication as to the meaning of the law in uh, a given jurisdiction or maybe in general. So what are these gap-filling methods? Some systems would bring religion to the picture. And if you read the civil codes of Islamic countries, they will say, well, go to the Sharia. You know, if legislation is silent, you probably, possibly, you know, the Islamic uh, tradition has some answer to the problem. Others would say, go to natural law, naming it like the old Louisiana code or eliminating the word. And here, this is sending you to principles of ethics, principles that may have some moral content or overtone that comport with human nature, things that seem to be in the nature of things and match the requirements of reason, justice. And the, yes, they can be understood in connection with religion, but you can also develop theories of natural law based on purely secular principles, which is what has been done in the 18th century at the time of the Enlightenment. You can say that the law should favor the common good, understanding this in a religious or non-religious manner. The word equity appears constantly or very often in codes or in the literature on gap feeling. Equity refers to a sense of fairness, but it's not fairness, you know, like justice in general, but it's rather fairness as applied to an individual case, okay, weighing the interests of both parties and trying to find the point of equilibrium you know, the fair solution. You have, interestingly, and I owe this uh, to Professor Longgrass, she's picked indeed that provision in Article 2055 saying that no one is allowed 
to take unfair advantage of another. That is really, indeed, the idea of uh, equity. Some refer to general principles of the law, another vague term or concept that needs to be uh, explained, if not defined. This is actually inviting the judge to try to identify some norms that are supporting the positive law in the legal order. Another way of saying this, to try to identify, okay, you don't find the letter of the law that would apply to the case, but what is the spirit of the code? You know, what are the doctrines, the principle that underlie, if you will, the legal system? And these general principles are sometimes cited uh, by the highest court, uh, including the French Court of Cassation. Interestingly, countries that have a very positivist culture don't like to mention natural law, but they are more comfortable discussing the general principle of the law because they say they are actually derived from positive law. Okay, these are underlying principle. One general principle of the law that has been identified by the Court of Cassation in recent years is that no one should contradict oneself to the detriment of another. So it doesn't mean that you cannot change your mind. Of course, everybody is free to change one's mind from time to time. But if you have clearly said, you know, in an articulated manner that you are taking a certain conduct, creating expectations on the part of others and other rely on your statement, it's not right to allow you, you know, to reverse course and change your mind. That may indeed cause a damage to someone else. There is no article saying this. By the way, this is the underlying principle of estoppels in the, the uh, common law systems. I have studied estoppel and I have articulated that principle and well, some of my thinking has moved into the jurisprudence of the French Court of Cassation, so it seems. But since they do not cite their secondary sources, be it jurisprudence or doctrinal sources, I'm not cited in any Court of Cassation judgment. I just have this satisfaction. Maybe it's me or maybe it's someone else who's been writing on the subject that has been influencing the thinking, which indicates that doctrine may also provide material to fill the gaps, which I have here on that slide. See, custom and uh, usages, of course, are called for. If there is a custom at point, remember that custom is obligatory, it's the law, then actually you do not have a gap if you have a custom to apply, right? But usages are a little bit different because usages, maybe way people are doing things, but if it is not binding, it's not obligatory. If it were obligatory, you would call it custom. Because it is not binding or obligatory, you call it a usage. This is giving valuable information to the judge because judges, you know, do not take, like to take people by surprise. They'd rather like to decide the case in a manner that could be uh, expected or anticipated by the parties when coming to them. The second in line is jurisprudence. Of course, if the judgments, I mean, if judges have done the work before and have identified a solution to fill the gap, you may, you must not, but you may indeed follow the inspiration because jurisprudence is persuasive but it is not binding, right? Doctrine, likewise, may be giving you, you see, possible answers to the problem, like in the previous example of this general principle uh, that you should not contradict yourself at uh, the detriment of others. You can push things even further, as the French scholar François Genie, uh, who wrote in the later part of the uh, um, 19th century, uh, actually at the turn of the century, he's been 
inventing the free scientific research. I alluded to him uh, earlier on, and we will revisit the thinking of Jenny when we discuss interpretation. Jenny was quite bold. He said, if the law is silent, it maybe the law was addressing you know, the topics, but society has changed, there are new technology, and it seems now we see a crack or a gap or whatever hole uh, in, in the code, you know, just like it may appear uh, in the Swiss cheese when it dries. Uh, what is the recommendation made by Jenny? He said, well, you may want to make reference to the principles of positive law, and he's actually the father of this concept of general principles of the law that is used by the French of the Court of Cassation now. Jenny was professor in Nancy uh, in the northeast of France. He's been the dean of the law school there. So principles of positive law. You don't have the answer in the letter. Ask for, try to identify the spirit of it. Another indication that he gave, nothing new, look into jurisprudence and doctrine. But he goes even further. If doctrine is a little bit passé or you know, has not been yet analyzing this new problem, you may, as a judge, look into sociological aspects of the disputes and look also at economic interest and sociology and economics are a big part in the thinking of Jenny. He is inviting actually the judge to put herself into the shoes of a legislator, you know, as if you had to create that law that is missing in the code. So without any shame, Jenny was inviting judges to act as lawmakers, to act as legislators. You can imagine that didn't make everyone happy uh, in a system that is very legislation-centered and recognize judge only the power to apply the law. But this is certainly a very creative way uh, of looking uh, into gap fillings because the task of the judge is a little bit different. The judge may consider equity, balancing the interests of plaintiff and defendant, but should also think what will be the impact of my thinking? What will be the impact of the rule that I'm proposing to solve that very case in other similar cases, which is exactly what legislators are doing. One civil code has actually been following the words of Jenny, and this is not surprising because the Swiss civil code was made shortly after Jenny had uh, written his book. And Article 1 of the Swiss code, of course, invites the judge to apply legislation, looking into the letter, but also the spirit of its provision. It then says in number two that in the absence of an applicable legislative disposition, the judge pronounces judgment in accordance with customary law. You go to custom and in the absence of a custom, according to the rule that he would establish if he were to act as a legislator. This is almost word by word the language of François Génie. And they add, he draws inspiration from the solutions adopted by the doctrine and the jurisprudence. That is probably one of the best and most contemporary provision regarding gap filling that you may find in any uh, civil code. I am going now to play with you and discuss an example where French courts have been confronted to a possible silent or gap in the code and try to fill the gap. The question is, may one abuse an ownership right? If you own, you can do whatever you want, okay? You own a book, you have read it, you may want to dispose of it. The best thing would be to donate it because someone else may be interested, but there is nothing wrong in throwing it into the bin or the bonfire. I don't recommend that. I love books. 
French Civil Code in Article 544 that has been unchanged since the original drafting defines ownership as the right to enjoy and dispose of things in the most absolute manner, meaning that you can even abuse those things, okay? You own an animal, you have the right to kill the animal. Mm. Things, okay. Things are changing here more and more we consider, and we have legislation like this in France that animals are sentient beings and couldn't be abused just in any way. And by the way, this is implied in the end of the article because it says provided that they are not used in a way prohibited by statutes or regulations, right? So if you have a statute limiting what you can do with things, you know, um, heritage is uh, protected these days. You cannot pull down, you know, an antique monument even if you own it. Uh, but still, that is leaving much room for possible abuses. And can we fight the abuses if you are victim of such an abuse? Can you use tort law provision? And for example, Article 1382, the defendant will say, well, I'm not at fault. I'm the owner. I use my things whatever way I please. And here is a case that came to the French Court of Cassation in 1915 during World War I. The defendant was owning a land neighboring the Clément Bayard warehouse and airfield. Clément Bayard were manufacturing airships, you know, this big uh, sort of air balloon, but uh, not the round balloon that we see in the Louisiana sky, sometimes like at the Gonzales festival, but these longer one that the Germans have later manufactured under the name of Zeppelin. And this defendant didn't like this. Yeah, you look, you have a postcard showing the warehouse. It looks a little bit strange, okay? This uh, airship, you know, pointing the nose there. Uh, and uh, what did he do? Well, he has been building a very strange wood structure on his land, a tall wooden structure, which was uh, 45 feet high, pretty tall and has been putting metal picks on top of it. And it said, they will see if they come too near my property, they will see and they will suffer for, for it, okay? It was a rather mischievous intent. Uh, the issue here is that one day, one of the airship has been damaged and torn by one of these picks, and Clément Bayard sued their neighbors. But the neighbors say, well, look, I didn't violate any statute or regulation. There is no particular zoning law that apply and restrict my doing, you know, any kind. This is, you know, my property. I do whatever I please. And the defendant cited to Article 544 of the Civil Code. Uh, but the other party said, yeah, but uh, are you living in this structure? Is that your house? Oh, no, of course not. Uh, are these pics that you have here of any use for you? What is your interest? Oh, no, it's just to piss you off. Oh, sorry, forgive my language. I'm not sure he has been using that word or the French equivalent in court. Uh, my apology. But, you know, he said, I am free. I do whatever I want with my property. The court answered saying, sir, the use you've made of your right is not a use for you, it is abuse. You are abusing a right that the law is giving you to serve your own interest. And it is clear from the record that you've done this only and exclusively in view of doing harm to your neighbor. We declare that this is an abuse of right. You are at fault and you have to compensate the victim. You have to compensate the Clement Bayard company for the loss of one of their airships. Uh, that was the start of a new doctrine based on a general principle of the law that you should not use your right exclusively in view of doing harm to other known under the name of abuse of a right, 
There is no civil code article on this, but you have now jurisprudence constante. You have several cases. I'm not going to tell you all the stories because you've already concluded that the French are obnoxious, which of course they are not, or at least not all of them. Um, and interestingly, some uh, civil codes are answering the matter and have made provision. Louisiana, in a sense, Article 667 says that although a proprietor may do with his estate whatever he pleases, still he cannot make any work on it which may deprive his neighbor of the liberty of enjoying his own or which may be the cause of any damage to him. Sort of idea that, you know, the limit to my liberty of freedom is just the place where the liberty of freedom of the other is actually starting, right? And Germany, in a provision that we have uh, visited earlier, Article 226 of the German Civil Code, says that the exercise of a right is not permitted if its only possible purpose consists of causing damage to another. So if it is clear that the exclusive purpose is to cause damage, this is not permitted. Uh, the Swiss have it too. In the second article of the code, every person must act in good faith in the exercise of his or her rights and in the performance of his or her obligations. I think I've modernized the translation here. Uh, just saying you have to act in good faith. Obviously, uh, the neighbor of the Clément Bayard or company was not acting in good faith. Oh, yeah. Read the next line. The manifest abuse of a right is not protected by law. Clearly, impliedly, you're not acting in good faith when you are doing an abuse of a right. Quebec has it too in their modern civil code. No right may be exercised with the intent of injuring another or in an excessive or unreasonable manner, which is contrary to the requirement of good faith. You see how the matching good faith, not doing harm in these uh, provisions. I will uh, conclude with a conversation that you may have with yourselves or among yourselves. I think I'm going to start a forum with that on uh, um, Moodle. Are we convinced that Louisiana is doing enough about abuse of a right? Should we have a general provision that covers ownership, but maybe other rights? Where would we place the provision? Well, we have the option of putting it in the Constitution as it has to do with liberty and may reflect, you know, some fundamental values in the civil code. That's another option. If you have it in the civil code, where would you place it? In the preliminary title, because it's very general, like the uh, um, Swiss or the Quebec have done it, or even the German in the general part of their code. Should you do this in book two, dealing with things, rewriting, amending, or enlarging the scope of Article 667 that we have just read? Do you want to have it in book three with the taught provision, maybe adjacent to 2315? I leave you with all these questions. Uh, I'm here to tell you how to identify problems, find solutions to them. I'm not there to feed you with the solutions and answers to every possible question. We will finish with this big question mark and go ahead. And if you eat Swiss cheese, it's better with bread. Thank you.